Last week I was in San Diego and I was visiting my friend, Justin Result French. If you're watching this, bro, this one's for you. So he asked me about my background and as I was talking a bit about why I got into mechanical engineering and one of the main reasons was because when I was a teen, I really liked Formula One and I wanted to work at in the Formula One um, environment, in the competition. And he was like, wow. And later on, as we were having lunch, he asked me more about it and like, what's up with Formula One? And he told me about how here in America, people really started liking Formula One kind of recently. They Most people didn't really know about it but people started watching it because of the series Drive to Survive on Netflix, which is, a, I've actually not watched much of it, but I know what's it, what it's about. And it's kind of like a, a bit of documentary, a bit of reality show about all of the intrigue that goes on between the drivers, between the teams and all of the emotions that go around on the races and it's funny because in brazil where i come from formula one has been a big thing for a long time actually nowadays it's not as big as it used to be because it was huge huge we had three very competent drivers that were champions including one that to this day is considered one of the greatest Brazilians of all time, one of the greatest legends of all time, Ayrton Senna, or in English you guys many times say Ayrton Senna. So I got this t-shirt. This is not Senna, but it's from McLaren. And since he was champion while racing for them three times, and he became a legend, mostly in a McLaren car. And also, this kind of reminds me of his helmet. So, so this is kind of an homage to Ayrton Senna. Rest in peace. So the thing is, why Americans started learning more about Formula One recently was because a few years ago, the Formula One group was bought by Liberty Media, which is an American company. And they've done a really good job of making it more marketable. And one of the things that they've done, well, there were many things, but one of the things was the Drive to Survive reality show that's on Netflix and that many people started watching. But also they did other things like they've brought more races to the United States and to other key markets that they wanted to target. So many people that had never heard of Formula One before now know about it because of this input that they put, because Liberty Media is a media group, as you can notice by the name. So they focus on that part of making the product more marketable and of putting it in front of more eyeballs. But the product was always good. I mean, of course there are years in which one of the teams gets too much ahead of the competition. So they're trying to change the rules so that it's harder for one team to have the supremacy. So they are always tinkering with the rules because sometimes you change the rules for the next few seasons and then one of the teams they just come out with some innovation that makes them so much better than the rest that it gets boring, frankly, it gets boring. Like, for example, around 2011, 12, 13, 14, Sebastian Vettel, or he won four times in a row for Red Bull. So it, it kind of gets boring if a team is always winning, winning, winning. The same thing with Michael Schumacher in 
in the early 2000s with Ferrari, you know, sometimes it's weird for me to say things with an American accent, like I'd say Ferrari or Ferrari, like they say it in Italy. But anyways, back to Ayrton Senna. So we have three legends in Brazil in the Formula One space. The first one was Emerson Fittipaldi, who won in the late 70s, early 80s. And then I think Emerson won two. I'm not sure if he won two or three. And then PK also won two or three. I think PK won two. And so Nelson Piquet was the second one. And then Ayrton Senna, who is the greatest of all time. For many people, including many of the drivers, they'll say that Ayrton Senna is the greatest of all time, even though he only, quote unquote, won three titles. But the thing is, what makes him a legend was, first of all, when he was racing, everyone knew he was the best. Everyone knew. Even when he started in Formula One, uh, at racing for Tolman, which was one of those bottom of the pack teams, he got some great results in a few races. He showed that he could be great from the get-go because he was very focused. So one of the legends of Ayrton Senna is that when he was still a kid or a teenager, he lost the race because it started to rain and he wasn't very good with the rain. So every time that it started raining in Sao Paulo, which is quite common actually, he would go to the track and race, race, race alone on the track, on the rain, just so he could train. So he became the best driver ever on the rain. He became an absolute legend. When it started raining, he would just pass everyone. But that wasn't it. That wasn't the only thing. He, he knew the limits of the car so well that there was a race. I think it was actually on the qualifying laps, like the day before the race. And as he was going through one of those laps, he hit something like slightly, like a little bump on one of the curves. Like he hit the wall, like did like this on the wall. And and he was pissed off. He was like, dude, this wall shouldn't be here. And you know, when it's a normal guy saying that, you, you think he's crazy, but he wasn't a normal guy. He was a fucking beast. You know, many of you might have seen the video of Kobe Bryant in which he was, you know, on the, the shoot around before the game. And he noticed that the basket or the rim of the basket was was off and he said it's like a quarter of an inch uh, above what it should be and then the guys went and measured it and it was exactly what he said it was a quarter of an inch above or below what it should be so it was that kind of attention of detail that Senna had and they went to the as they were walking around the track they went to the the turn that he had like hit the wall not really hit it just like you know when you just touch it and it really did it had moved he wasn't bullshitting anyone so there there had been some kind of crash or something someone had hit the wall and and so there was like a metal part that moved a little bit and since he was really on the edge on the limit he was almost touching it every lap that he was doing but since it moved a little bit but just little a little fraction like a centimeter or something he hit the wall because he was so close to the limit that this slight little move was enough for him to hit it so this is the kind of guy that we're talking about and he was so good that Brazilians would, every Sunday at 9 a.m., usually 9 a.m., those were the times for the race, most of the races. I, I'll say we, but not actually because I wasn't born at that time, but people would 
every Sunday, everyone would gather at someone's house, watch the race, and then have lunch together, the typical Brazilian affair with their families. And everyone was watching because in any given race, Senna could win. And every time he won, they played the national anthem and there was this little song, that little music that they play every time, like when he won the race. So everyone would be super emotional, super happy. And there weren't many things going on for Brazil at the time. Like we had good teams in soccer, but we weren't winning. The last time we had won was in 1970 in the World Cup. And to Brazilians, you either win the World Cup or you're a failure. Anything else, anything below that, any other tournament, I mean, it's always good to win, but if it's not the World Cup, it doesn't count. For Brazilians, that's it. And since we weren't winning, we were just coming out of a military dictatorship. It, and the 80s were a terrible time economically for Brazil because we had foreign debt and then you know with the when Paul Volcker raised the interest rates in America a lot in the late 70s early 80s so everyone that had foreign debt in dollars now they had like a lot of interest to pay so it was basically unpayable and this ended up leading to a series of mistakes well there were a series of mistakes before as well, of course. And eventually this led to hyperinflation. So Brazil really didn't have much going on. And Senna, because he was so good and also not only because of that, but because of him as a person as well, like he has this demeanor about him. And it, it was funny because in interviews and stuff, he was typically very calm like very relaxed. He was one of the first drivers that actually really took seriously um, his physical preparation. So he was very, very fit for his time. He had a, a very good personal trainer, um, physical coach type of guy, Nuno Cobra, that, that's famous in Brazil also because he has some books about, about you know, uh, the how emotionally prepared you must be to do that kind of thing in sport and how this can translate to other parts of your life like business and even with your family. So his resting heart rate was like 40 beats per minute, something ridiculous like that because of how fit he was. And even when he was in a car at 300 kilometers per hour, that's like 200 miles an hour, swiftly turning and at the time, the, the cars were much harder to, to, like literally harder. They were heavier. You didn't have assistance like you have nowadays. Not saying that today it's easy, not at all. It's always hard. Like we have no idea how hard it is to drive one of those cars at those staggering speeds and being able to focus and to twist and turn and all of the g-forces that act upon your body you have no idea i have no idea either like i have an idea but I've, I've never been put through that but the amount of fitness if if you don't believe me just search for a video of like workouts for formula one drivers it's ridiculous like the um, the strength that their necks have to have is ridiculous like it's 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 ridiculous it's nuts how much of these guys are athletes even if they don't look so much like they're athletes if you look at them they look like yeah maybe they're kind of skinny if you look they don't look super strong but they are strong as fuck but for their specific duties they're strong as fuck they have like the, the core strength off the charts neck strength off the charts to turn a steering wheel at those speeds, you need to be very strong. Like, But they don't look like a bodybuilder. They don't look super buff, but they are very strong. And he was one of the first ones that really took his conditioning seriously. And also another thing that was important 
to cement his legend is that when he was racing for McLaren, he had another legend as his as the other driver for the for McLaren. So when he got there, Alain Prost was already there. And Alain Prost, or Prost maybe in English, he is in and of itself, he's also a legend. I think he was champion two times when Senna got there. And really, Senna was still like a young guy coming in. He, he'd raced for maybe three years before that in second, third level teams. And then he was going to McLaren, which was one of the best teams, if not the best. And he ended up having a rivalry with Prost because there were two legends and they, were, they had more or less the same car and they were going head to head. There was a year that I think only one of the races they didn't win. It was something ridiculous like this, like either Senna or Prost won each of the races except for one. It was ridiculous because they were so good and they had the two best drivers. So the, the car was good, the drivers were good, like win-win, right? And they had some interesting debacles when they were racing together. For instance, I think in the first year, Senna won the championship. And then on the second year, they were racing in Japan. And if Senna didn't, you know, you know, make points in that race, didn't get in the in the points scoring threshold, Prost would be the champion. So what did he do? In the first turn or in the beginning of the race, Senna tried to pass him and he threw his car in front of him. So they crashed. But the funny thing is, Prost abandoned the race, but Senna said, fuck it, I need to win. And he was such a beast that he went back to the race and won the race. But they didn't want him to win. Like at the time there was this the chief for FIA, the chief for the Formula One thing was, damn, now I I forgot his name, but he was a Frenchman and Prost is also a Frenchman. Now I forgot his name. I think it's a, damn, I forgot his name. But he, they eliminated Senna from that race because like some of the guys working at the race kind of pushed his car so he could go get back in the race. And since they did that, they said, no, you can't do this. And, and they eliminated him, like, so he didn't get any points. And then Prost was the champion. So the year after that, that was in Japan. It was the second to last race, I think. The year after that, the tables were turned. So if Prost didn't, didn't point, Senna would be champion. So what did he do? He did the same thing. Prost tried to pass him and Senna, he didn't do anything. He didn't move his car. So like he, he stood there and like they crashed and Senna ended up winning and winning the championship for the second time. So it was, so they had this rivalry and Prost ended up getting out of McLaren because it was getting, things were getting ugly, but they always had a lot of respect for me, for each other. And I've seen some interviews of Prost. He's now an older guy, of course, probably around his seventies right now, or maybe late sixties. And he says that he misses Senna because they were rivals, but they really respected each other. You know, it was that kind of thing because to really be a rival or to really have a rival, they have to be at the same level as you. So they were two dogs fighting out. So they really had a lot of respect for each other. But the thing is, 
this story is getting too long, you think? The Williams team started making awesome cars. They had Adrian Newey, who is an absolute legend at making Formula One cars as the main designer for the car, the main project. Not sure how they call this, but like the lead guy, like lead engineer for, for the cars. And they started winning, 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 winning. And McLaren had a rough patch, so their car wasn't as good. And Senna tried to go to Williams a few years, but couldn't because when Prost was there, yeah, because Prost had gone from McLaren to Williams and won a title or two while he was there. So he tried to go, but they couldn't have both of them together. So when Prost retired, they finally got Senna. And Senna went there and I think it was the third or fourth race in the 1994 championship. It was the 1st of May, 1994. 1st of May is always a very sad day in Brazil. So it was the Italian Grand Prix, the Italian race in Imola. Yeah, I think it's in Imola, San Marino. And it was a weird weekend because on Friday, um, Rubens Barrichello, who was, at the time, he was a very young driver on his first or second year in the Formula One, also Brazilian, he had a very ugly crash and he had to go to the hospital and he had a terrible crash, like he almost died on Friday. And then on Saturday, on the, the qualifying laps and stuff, Austrian driver Roland Ratzerberger also crashed and he did die. So the drivers, many of them didn't actually want to race on Sunday because come on one guy almost dies and then the next day one guy actually dies so they were like holy shit we don't want to race it's not it's too dangerous but of course there's a lot of money involved and uh, it's I remember the French guy's name he was still the the boss Jean-Marie Balestre so Balestre was the boss that fucked over with Senna a couple times in the past and now he was like dude we have to race blah 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 we have contracts whatever whatever and Senna really didn't want to race like every documentary you see about this it's you can see in his face that he was pissed off he was very like he was an introverted guy naturally but he was like you can see something was off with him and but at the same time he was one of the leaders for the pilots so he was very vocal at the time that he didn't want to race that they shouldn't race that it was dangerous he was one of the first pilots that advocated for this for more safety for the pilots for the drivers but you know money talks and they decided to have that race anyways and on one of the first laps of that race no one's sure about what happened, but there are some furies. But Senna, there was this this curve, the Tamburello curve, and his car didn't didn't turn. Like he went straight off, full speed and crashed and it was a very dangerous curve because it didn't have a lot of escape room and you know things to naturally stop a car if they did if they did what he did and his car just went straight ahead and he tackled like the the barriers the guardrail i'm not sure like how to say this head on and 
Well, there are many theories, but anyways, about like why this happened, like if the car broke before or if it hit, like if the bottom of the car hit the ground, so he lost traction from the, the air, you know, the aerodynamic traction that keeps those cars on the ground solo, or if it, or if he, his, the column of the steering wheel broke, like no one knows exactly which of these or all of these were the key reason. But the thing is he hit the wall pretty much head on at pretty much full speed, around 300 kilometers per hour, 250, something like that. And with the impact, well, first of all, the impact was so big and the cars weren't really made to like they are today. Like the car safety became much better after that because especially because of him because he was a legend and he died so they were like holy shit we need to improve this but anyways um one you know a, a, a steel column i'm not sure if it was some say it was the steering wheel but i think it's actually from the suspension like a steel beam kind of thing hit his helmet like on the you know that glass that they see through and it was like it was like if he had been shot on the head basically like the steel beam like just came through and hit him in the head and also with the impact he would have broken his neck anyway so he would have se severed over here and like the ligaments of the spine and he would have died anyway, probably. But he died on the track. They didn't officially say he died on the track because if, he, if they did, they'd have to stop the race and they clearly didn't want to do that. So officially, they say he died in the hospital a few hours later. But even if his heart was beating, which it might have, they said it was, but there was nothing that could be done. Like it was, he couldn't be saved. So that was that. And Brazil's heart sank. Like we lost a legend. I was a baby at the time because I was born in February of that year. So it was like two and a half months old. Of course they don't remember but Brazil completely stopped his body was repatriated to Brazil to Sao Paulo which is his hometown it's funny to say hometown for Sao Paulo because it's so huge and he was buried like if he was a head of state like many important famous people and even i think some head of, heads of state from other countries came to his funeral because of so how important he was hundreds of thousands if not millions of people went to the streets because they had like the funeral at, I'm, I'm not sure now where if it was like probably sao paulo's um the chamber for the the state congress i think it was there that they had it or maybe it was in the palace for the governor i'm not sure right now but they had this public public funeral in which people could go and pay homage to him of course it was a closed casket because he probably didn't have much of a face anymore unfortunately but it had the Brazilian flag on top of the casket and his family was there and and apparently I, my parents took me there <laughs> when I was a, a baby because my, my dad was a very big fan of his and he must have been very sad at the time and and yeah we went there we were part of that funeral celebration and 
to this day, people remember Ayrton Senna very fondly. He's still a legend. People still make movies about him. Netflix, I'm not sure if they released it yet, but they were going to release a new series about him. Uh, a fiction series, but based on him, like, like remaking his life kind of thing. Kind of like that movie with Niki Lauda and James Hunt. Now I forgot, but it's so rush. That movie is awesome. If you guys want to know more about how Formula One was back in the day, Rush is a very good movie between uh, with a rivalry between two legends as well. But anyways, yeah, that's a bit of the lore behind Formula One, especially Ayrton Senna, which is the main driver and the main legend for Brazil. But we kept having good pilots after. We had Rubens Barrichello, who was the guy that almost died on the Friday before that race. He he raced for Ferrari for like 10 years with Michael Schumacher. He was the, the second fiddle to Schumacher. And yeah, he must be the guy with the most runners up in Formula One titles ever because he was <laughs> he was always up there. Then we had Felipe Massa, which also raced for Ferrari for a long time and he lost in the last curve by one point in 2008 and I was there with my dad as well in Brazil last race and he did everything he had to like he had to win and Lewis Hamilton couldn't be like he had to come like sixth or below something like that or fifth or below and he did everything perfectly he got the pole position the fastest lap he won the race but in the last curve Hamilton passed Timo Glock and got to the position he needed to be at so if there was one less lap on that race Massa would have been champion so it was it was a very anticlimactic day it was like it was so close and his team made a lot of mistakes through that year so in Singapore they forgot like the the gas how do you say like the gas nozzle they, that you put in the car on a pit stop like they forgot to take it off so he lost like a minute on that pit that he shouldn't have and he ended up not making like he he would have made more points of course on that race so they that was one of the mistakes they made other mistakes so he should have won the championship but he didn't and that would be the first championship for brazil since senna in 91 so it was a bit a bit sad and after that you know we kind of lost a little bit of of the love we've had for Formula One because the Brazilians, you know, they, the year after that, there was an accident with Felipe Massa that won spring from Rubens Barrichello's car on a test. The spring like fell off the car and hit Massa's helmet. So, like he lost that year, like he couldn't race for the rest of the year and it was like a heavy injury kind of thing. And then he was never the same and never like had a chance to really win it all anymore. And and then we had the likes of Hamilton, the likes of Beto, and now we have also Verstappen who's winning a lot. So we never had Brazilians really competing for the championship after that. And also, yeah, we haven't had a Brazilian driver for a while in Formula One as well. So we kind of lost that appetite for F1 racing. But this, in not, not much of a nutshell, because it's kind of long, but 
this is a bit of the story of Formula One in Brazil. Why we we have this big story with it? Why we have a lot of yeah a lot of history actually with it. We had legends in the past. We had good drivers in the not so far away past, like a decade, 15 years ago. And Brazilians love winning, especially. So when we had those guys that were winning, we love them. And we also love cars. We also love racing, um, driving fast. So that's a little bit about why we like Formula One, why I did mechanical engineering in the first place, even though I never worked in Formula One, not yet at least. And a little bit of why Formula One has has changed in the last few years and and become a bit more famous in places like the United States because they are focusing more on making like they had a good product and now they're marketing it to markets that they want to, you know, to come to these markets and make money in them. And, and these are some of the changes. So I hope you like this. And this one's for everyone that likes to drive fast.